Hello, everyone. I see people are still filing in. Uh, please welcome. Please come in. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, maybe wait another minute or two for people to join. Um, actually, probably less than a minute. We should respect people's time for being on time. Oh, hi. We have good engagement already, guys. This is going to be a great panel. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello, world. Uh, my name is Alexia Jordan. I am the Innovation uh, Cyber and National Security Analyst for the Lincoln Network. Um, We're super excited to have all of you all here today to discuss this very timely topic of semiconductors. Um, I'm assuming if you all are joining this call, you care about microelectronics um, in one form or the other, and probably its security implications. Um, so I would, hey, so I would highly recommend that you all follow the work of all of our panelists today. They're on Twitter, they're on YouTube, they're very easily Googleable, um, and they really are the real deal uh, when it comes to great online content for you to continue your learning about semiconductors past today and why you should really take a more active approach um, in your understanding of it. Um, so with us, we have um, Dr. James uh, Mulvanon. Um, he's the uh, Associate Director of Intelligence Integration. Um, we have Mr. Stephen uh, Ezo, the Vice President of Global Innovation Policy at ITIF. We have um, Ann Lips, um, the Director of National Security, Director of Cyber and National Security uh, from the Lincoln Network. And we have Dr. Roslyn Layton, who is the co-founder of the China Tech Threat. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and let them do a bit of self-introduction. Um, and I want them just to obviously introduce themselves, say just a drop about why they are really um, good on this topic and why semiconductors is like the thing to focus on right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and start off with James and then we'll move on to Rosalind and then Stefan and then Dan. Thank, uh, thank you, Alexia. Um, the short version of the story is uh, I'm a Chinese linguist by training. Mm -hmm. uh, and I run a team of 37 uh, cleared Chinese linguists that does contract research for the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. um, and our main focus has been for 20 years, this nexus between uh, the Chinese information revolution and U.S. national security. And mm -hmm. so semiconductors are really important because they are the foundational technology on which all of the other technologies are based. And the reason it's particularly important in the last 10 years is because we had largely through hyperglobalization offshored the entire information and communication technology supply chain in China while it was becoming a major cyber threat actor. And now the major dialogue is how do we in fact secure this supply chain given the increasing trade and other military tensions with China. So I think it's, it's top shelf for the Biden people and I, and I think that it should be uh, of concern to the listeners. Yes, well, uh, it's an honor today to be with such distinguished panelists. Thank you so much, Lincoln Network, for putting this event together. You have been the bridge between Washington and Silicon Valley, and I have uh, been able to work with Lincoln Network over the years uh, on many important issues, notably getting more radio spectrum available for entrepreneurs. And so th there are so many things you do, and I want to thank you for taking this time to democratize this issue of semiconductors and why it's not something that belongs just in the domain of, you know, a high thinking, it is something we should all care about. Um, my background, I have a PhD in economics, uh, looking at internet regulation, and I study regulatory regimes in different countries. And I've seen in my data over the years, uh, how I've looked at different um, mobile application ecosystems, how American companies have been displaced by um, uh, Chinese firms. And not necessarily because they're better, but from different policies, we can see today, no US, very, you really can't get American internet applications in China. It's very hard to do. So US has missed out on a trillion dollar opportunity. Um, when we, uh, at this time, it is, um, we can be very easily distracted by politics, but we cannot forget about policy. 
and there are important things that we have to do to secure leadership in this field. Uh, China certainly wants to unseat the US for economic and military reasons, but that would have very grave uh, effects in the United States, a loss of tremendous number of high paying jobs. Um, we've already seen loss of, of, of strategic industries. And I think one of the greatest concerns is that we see um, US actors themselves, American companies are accelerating some of this uh, decline themselves. Uh, and we also ha have to look at the response, strategic response of the US government or, and also with actors, the response has not been sufficient. And I'm sure we're gonna get into that today, but I just wanna say thank you to Lincoln Network for putting this together. Well, I'd also like to add my thanks to Alexia and to the Lincoln Network for the invitation to participate today and echo what Rosalind and James said. I mean, listen, apart from biotechnology in the midst of a pandemic, semiconductors represent the world's most important industry. Semiconductors contributes $2.7 trillion to global GDP annually, supports at least 7 trillion downstream. And you look at the numbers like from McKinsey suggesting that fully one quarter of global GDP now comes out of digital industries or the application of digital to traditional industries like manufacturing. And you see that semiconductors are the foundation to everything from the future of AI to uh, high performance computing and driverless cars. So they're essential for the economy. And as James notes, they're also vitally essential to our national security. Uh, and so ensuring US leadership in this vital technology platform becomes critical to our economic and military future. Uh, we're interested at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, of course. Um, uh, we've written several reports. Uh, one from last fall was called an alliance approach to semiconductor competitiveness. We talked about how a group of like-minded nations can coordinate to collectively advance a semiconductor innovation ecosystem predicated upon market-based uh, terms, uh, collaboration on technology development, export control standards, et cetera. I'll also have a report coming out in the next two weeks speaking to one of Rosalind's points, and it's going to be called The Impact of China's Policies on Global Semiconductor Innovation. It'll document the extreme range of Chinese innovation mercantilism in the sector and document explicitly how it uh, denudes and constrains the capacity of our firms to effectively innovate in the sector. Hey, Alexia, and, and thank you to our fellow panelists and to all the guests joining us. I'm Dan Lips with the Lincoln Network. I work on uh, cyber national security and at Lincoln Network, we've been focused for a while on this, um, the challenge and competition between China and the United States on technology. A particular focus for us has been uh, China's sharp power strategy and the risks of the spread of digital authoritarianism, as well as uh, the risks to US economic and national security from China's use of uh, cyber espionage and uh, tech transfer uh, tactics. Um, anticipating the new administration and a new Congress, uh, we've been studying uh, the recent policy response to um, the semiconductor issue and put out a report at the end of the year on answering the China chip challenge, which tried to dig into these issues, which we'll be talking about today. As you guys can see, we have the top tier, the passionate people on this topic. Um, so very, very glad you all are joining us. And to the audience, I love this engagement already. We have people raising their hands, asking questions. Um, so I have my questions lined up. I literally have like a page for these people, um, but I want you all to hop in and join in too. So as you come up with it, um, as you hear something that sparks your interest, please drop a question in the Q&A box. And my hope is that we can integrate your questions with my questions so we don't have to wait till the end of the event. Um, you know, to get you all's questions. And I hope that that will give more space for the audience to get their opinions out um, and get their questions in, I'm sorry. So um, I'd like to kick us off with Rosalind. I know that everyone just kind of gave their two cents about why semiconductors um, are important and why we're talking about semiconductor technology. But like, why did we just come out the gate talking about China? Like what is China doing in this realm? Um, and why was, you know, it a part of everyone's introductory conversations? Like, why are we talking about China if we're talking about semiconductors? Yes, so before I begin, I just wanna say again to the listeners, everybody has mentioned some of the reports they've done and maybe Alexia, you can make some links to it um, on the, uh, when, when you post up your event uh, sheet. Uh, I have a report where I look at the policy landscape, the various policy responses to this issue. Um, 
Uh, Stephen has tremendous reports uh, that you can find in ITIF. And you know, James has written some of the most important definitive reports uh, about the, uh, the links between Chinese military and a semiconductor industry. They're discussed in the Wall Street Journal and, and, and so forth. So, um, I'd, so if, if people feel like they can't follow along, they can get those links uh, at, at the end. And I haven't read yet uh, Lincoln Network, so that's first on my list now. So thank you for saying that. So in sort of putting this into context, we're in 2021. This is the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. And so I think that we need to recognize they have been on a long march with global supremacy and military domination for a long time. And in many respects, they have advanced on a number of their goals. They have ahead of the timeline, if you look at what's going on in Hong Kong, for example. Uh, in many fields of advanced technologies, they have uh, succeeded, they have displaced, they have overtaken uh, and have you know, essentially complete control. If you look at the electronics we use today, almost everything is made in China. And the next step for the People's Republic of China is to own the data in the device. And that's not just the intellectual property of the semiconductors themselves, which is arguably the highest value input, the most important from the IP side, they want to own the data as well. And they want to have the, you know, the capabilities from that. So, you know, that is why we're here. Um, I, I would say that uh, uh, we have also had um, a sleep at the wheel, if you will. I mean, there's many uh, discussing why have we not recognized this? In fact, we've been enabling it. This was a sort of view of the responsible stakeholder. Well, let's let China come into the World Trade Organization. It'll be a good actor. We'll help them democratize. That hasn't happened. And, you know, we've had to have now, we have to have a very strong policy response. So if you look in Congress today, you'll see we have decouplers and people talking about punishments and then those who say, how do we salvage the relationship? Uh, so there are a, a lot of things going on with regard to semiconductors and it is the one field where um, remarkably China is not further, but that's also a result of very, very important policy measures that have been in place in the US to mitigate or slow its development. But I would say my greatest concern is that for the lack of policy response, that US companies continue to empower Chinese military entities, whether they know it or not. I mean, great American companies like Applied Materials and KLA or Lamb Research. Now it's one thing that they can supply their entities in China. They have factories there that they own. Of course, we can understand they need to supply their companies. But we have known Chinese military entities that um, are wanting to buy as much equipment. And this is actually the semiconductor manufacturing equipment, the means of production so China can produce its own chips itself. And so that is really the, the crucial issue here. It's one thing to try to steal bits and pieces, but you want what China wants to do is to really make their own <clears throat> factory, create the IP themselves, produce these chips that are the, the, the width of a few atoms together. So that is the important uh, thing that we have to focus on is how American government, its various agencies <clears throat> create the appropriate response because companies themselves wanna make money. They want to sell their products. They have a lot of money to be made in China and they don't necessarily think about national security. It's hard for them to integrate that. It's not their job, frankly. Um, so this is where the US government has to step up where it identifies these are the actors um, that we have to be concerned about and restrict the um, <clears throat> sanction those actors and restrict working with them. And so I know we'll, we'll get into this more, but that is, uh, you know, that's part of the table setting today. Alexia, you're on mute. <laughs> you would forget that I work at a tech firm. You really <laughs> would. Um, so that leads perfectly, thank you, Roslyn, for that explanation. That leads perfectly into a question that I wanna ask James. Um, James has this great story that he, 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 uh, he, he put out a couple years ago about his um, iPhone 6 and how he took it apart. And um, you, know, you just talked about Roslyn, uh, their kind of military plans, their grand strategy about not just the chips, but the data and you know, their, their mercantilist you know, ways and policies. And if I am my mother, I'm like, okay, you know, and isn't everyone you know, trying to make money and expand their military? Um, so James, I'm hoping you can kind of bring it home for us and, and make you know, everyone understand like why this is, um, this, this, this distant foreign policy kind of issue um, is important for folks on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Well, the, the background, Alexia, um, and I'll tell the short version of the story, is that um, we began noticing the extent to which uh, China was taking advantage of the fact that the world had made the, its IT workshop production facilities all in China, um, that China didn't want to pay any royalties, particularly on protocols related to standards. They didn't want to pay Qualcomm for CDMA, and they didn't want to pay any of this other stuff. So they paid a lot of money to develop their own parallel set of China standards for every possible information and communication technology protocol, high definition television and IPv6 and all these sorts of things. And almost to a one, they were all rejected by the relevant international standards organizations, whether UN ISO or IEEE or IETF um, as being technically inferior. And this was very frustrating to Beijing. So they began using their market leverage, the fact that these products were being assembled and certified in China to begin pressuring companies to add these rejected standards. And as you all know, if you wanna understand what the future of the network looks like, standards become absolutely critical. And one of the first ones they pushed was something called WAPI, which was their 802.11 uh, Wi-Fi alternative standard. And, um, and it was rejected um, as being inferior to 802.11. And so they forced the handset manufacturers in China uh, to add a dual WAPI chipset um, alongside the Wi-Fi chipset uh, inside the phones. And it started with Nokia. But you know, you say to yourself, how is it that the iPhone 6, which had end-to-end -end encrypted iMessage, how is it possible that the Chinese would possibly allow that to be sold in China? Um, and a lot of it has to do with, as you know, we're going dark here, controlling the device and being able to get to the device. But if you go on Apple's website, this is a supply chain issue. This is really where we're at with semiconductors. If you go on Apple's website, you can't find a single shred of evidence that there is a Chinese WAPI chipset in this phone. Um, and you, I only found a couple of articles on the Chinese side. And you call Apple and you say, hey, what's going on in here? And they say, oh yeah, well, that chipset was a black box that was given to us. We don't know what's inside of it. The three out of the four, the crypto algorithms are state secrets. And you just, you have trouble believing that control freaks like Apple would allow this to happen. And then you say, well, what about the antenna interference study? What freak is it up? What frequency is it operating at? And then they very quickly got nervous and hung up the phone. Um, so I paid a, a French hardware hacker friend of mine who's, whose nom de guerre is Johnny Cash, C-A-C-H-E. Uh, and he took a bunch of these phones apart and actually identified the rogue frequency for WAPI. Um, and the reason why that's important to your mother and my mother, my mother, I just got her on an iPhone last year, is there could be a rogue WAPI node operating at a different frequency right here in the room with me interrogating my phone, God knows how, just like WAPI, just like Wi-Fi does and all the other GPS locators and everything else. And I wouldn't be the none the wiser. Um, and so from an information security perspective, it was really unacceptable that the global supply chain resulted in this rogue um, uh, security standard and chipset being put in a device that I rely so heavily on. And it was so difficult for me to find out anything about it um, and certainly difficult to understand what was going on with it. And that to me, that story is a microcosm of the larger supply chain challenge. And this is why when General Selva was vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff four or five years ago, he did a review of the entire Pentagon supply chain. And he said, you know, we can't protect everything. And what was the one thing he said we need to protect? Semiconductors and integrated circuits. And he said, that is the hill that we need to die on because again, it is that foundational technology under all the other technologies. And that's really why of all the industries that the US government through policy and everything else and Stephen's organization has been fabulous on this issue. I'm a huge supporter of the idea of a coalition with Cisco and Nokia and Ericsson on 5G and all these other sort of no brainers that the antitrust lawyers are like, we can't do that. We're like the hell we can't um, is you know, understanding who our friends are and building secure supply chains uh, so that we're not so reliant on a major threat actor. Um, I think that you all, James, you definitely hit the nail on the head. I wanted to get a couple of amens out, but I didn't want to interrupt your talking. Um, <laughs> so we have, um, I think two or three questions lined up in the queue, but I want to um, 
shift the question over to Dan um, so we can get just a little bit of an idea about um, what we might be able to expect just to frame the conversation from the Biden administration. Like, so we've heard that this is what China's doing. We know why semiconductors are important. Now we understand why it's important to our day-to-day -day lives. And it's like, okay, cool, now this is important. What might we expect the next administration to do? And then after that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, throw in a couple of audience questions. So Dan, um, Obviously, the inauguration happened this week, um, and I'm wondering if you could off, um, if you could offer any uh, advice or uh, to the national security or economic team about the future of national semiconductor policy over the next four years. Um, what would you highlight? What do you think is important? Um, and what direction, just generally, might you think that they're going to go? One of the encouraging messages I heard from President Biden's speech the other day was you're looking for areas of unity and common ground. Um, we heard Senator McConnell uh, speaking on the Senate floor that um, Senate Republicans would work on potential areas of agreement to address major challenges facing the country. And if we look at the past um, few years on Capitol Hill, there's been growing recognition that this is uh, one of the top threats facing the United States. And specifically, we've seen you know, bipartisan measures to strengthen uh, the review of uh, foreign investment and to provide a greater authority to use export controls to address these types of threats. And just this past month we, with the NDAA, there's new measures aimed to strengthen uh, the US semiconductor industry with, uh, with greater federal support through research and, and investment. Um, I don't have a crystal ball in what the Biden administration is thinking, but um, I, if I were in their shoes or advising uh, his national security team, I would be you're looking at this as one of the great opportunities they have to uh, address a, a challenge that's widely recognized across uh, Capitol Hill and beyond, um, and to, to continue some of the progress that has been made over the past five years. Um, yeah, I heard some of those encouraging notes too. And um, if you are kind of like following this space, you'll see that there is a lot of talk about it. Um, but in that talk, you know, is that it, it, from both sides of the aisle, everyone's like, well, this is super important. We need to do something. Well, okay, great. So what exactly are we going to do and how fast can we do it? Um, Steven, you have, um, I think, some really great opinions on this. And um, I'd love to hear what you think the US government um, should do to encourage other countries with whom we share a relationship with from working with China in a way that'll meet their semiconductor goals. Um, and alongside you know, our obvious European uh, allies, I'd love your take um, on, on Taiwan and how we might be able to work with some of their um, obviously very popular semiconductor companies. Um, I'm gonna like tack a little second thing on there if I can. We're yeah. talking about like the US government, the US government, what can the US government do? Do you have any opinion, um, especially from an economic standpoint of what carrot and stick measures we might be able to offer from the private sector that might kind of help facilitate this, um, this, this goal of not having our ally, working closer with our allies to stop this thing from happening. Yeah, well, and, and before I maybe get into that, maybe just add one more frame to our conversation that I think is important your audience understands. Um, you know, China uh, in 2014 articulated something called the National Integrated Circuit Strategy. And this was a formal plan connected with $150 billion of investment where China said very literally that its goal was to quote, have their imports of US semiconductors by the year 2025, and ideally by the year 2030 to be in the position to have a completely autarkic capacity to have a closed loop end to end semiconductor development ecosystem, all the way from the R&D and the design to the fabrication to the package assembly and test. The point is that China ideally would like to position itself um, with the capacity uh, of, of autarky um, to be able to be completely self-sufficient in the semiconductor domain. Now, that matters greatly uh, when 36% of US semiconductor enterprise revenues actually comes from China, and this country has committed to uh, being a member of the global trade community, the WTO, uh, that in theory is based on the principle of comparative advantage and rules govern and private enterprise led market-based trade. So, my point is, uh, China's policies here uh, both represent a strategic challenge to the United States, but also to the global trade system that they've said they want to be part of. So to your question, you know, how, what do we do about it? Well, I mean, the first thing uh, really is, I, I think, to be working much more closely with allies across a range of activities. The United States needs to get back into TPP. 
We need to work with allies to have a response to the One Belt, One Road, the digital, uh, the Silk Initiative. Um, you know, China is going uh, to Thailand or to the Philippines, putting in place massive, you know, national level smart grids or intelligent transportation systems or smart cities. They're using hundred billion dollar land and credit from the Chinese government. We need to work with allies to say, how can we collaborate to have like-minded companies going in and offering a response in those types of uh, places around the world. Um, we need to coordinate on export controls. Uh, would be a, a good idea if we could um, maybe have a group uh, outside the WASNAR agreements of leading countries like Holland, Taiwan, uh, some of the Europeans developing semiconductor technologies and manufacturing equipment and get on the same page with how we handle issues like export controls, uh, combating uh, espionage and combating IP theft. Uh, the Trump administration did set up something called MAST, the Multilateral Action on Sensitive Technologies. It'd be a nice idea if the Trump administration could continue and expand that. One thing we should also do is work with our allies to identify any case where a Chinese entity or a Chinese company has been responsible for IP theft or economic espionage and begin to work to deny those companies access to our marketplaces. Um, and uh, I'd like to let my colleagues stand on some of those ideas, uh, but, but those would be some of the places where I would start um, uh, uh, with an allied response. And the other part of the equation uh, is of course the domestic response, right? Because we do need to run faster. Um, and we have challenges. Uh, uh, you look at Intel, uh, which has had some difficulty in moving beyond 10 nanometer or seven nanometer. That's not because of China. Um, that is uh, uh, because of, of a number of factors, but part of it is um, uh, if you look at uh, federal investment in R&D in the semiconductor sector, um, the, the numbers are truly staggering. Uh, if I may, I have the number right here. So 40 years ago, federal funding for semiconductor R&D was more than double the level of private sector funding. However, by 2019, the private sector invested 23 times more than the federal government in basic and applied semiconductor R&D activity. Our government needs to be much more to help our companies innovate in the sector. And that was the purpose of the CHIPS Act legislation that Dan mentioned uh, to put more money into R&D, to put more money into programs like Manufacturing USA that provide uh, a, 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 a landscape for pre-competitive research to be done within the industry so we can try and advance to that next level of technology development. I'm not sure if the audience is like paying attention like to, to, to Stephen when he's talking or if they're kind of looking at all the panelists, but if you guys are paying attention, everyone is like nodding their heads as Stephen is talking. Like there is a reason that, you know, we have these people on, um, he, he hit on so many points that obviously all of our panelists agree with um, and they are concrete things that we could actually work towards. Um, so on a much more uh, micro level, one of our panelists um, asked, let me go to her question. It was very lovely. Um, how does a regular citizen, someone like me, help out with this effort? What if I have ideas to put out, for example? So we are saying, that what should the government do? Maybe what should the private sector do? What should citizens do? And this question could be to anyone that wants to answer it. Uh, I'll well, take that. Want, it, it, yeah, go, go oh, ahead. Oh, look, see, <laughs> you have a popular question, Mary. That's fantastic. No, well, you know what? I wanted to, let, actually, I, let, I want to follow up on the, what Stephen and Dan had said before, but let's let, let James uh, uh, take it. Oh, well, I was just saying, if you want to be a real policy nerd, uh, you can comment on uh, federal register notices related to semiconductor policy. Um, but, you know, uh, that, that would mean you have absolutely no life uh, whatsoever. Um, no, I mean, the first, the first thing is, is and, I, and I don't mean this to be patronizing, um, but an informed citizenry. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of people who just didn't understand the extent to which for purely economic and financial gain reasons, largely for venture capital companies and other people, um, we over-globalized and uh, offshored um, a significant percentage of our high-tech industry um, and didn't think through the possibilities of what it would mean. And I'm not, and I'm not talking about bringing coal jobs back to West Virginia. Uh, what I'm talking about is the kind of supply chain problem we have now um, where we made, where we over centralized, over clustered, to use the industry term, we over clustered um, a semiconductor tooling design and fabrication in places like Kunshan uh, and other places in the PRC. 
Um, and so if there is one industry where two factors are, are, are in play, and I think, I think Stephen would agree with this. One, the US still at the high end still has um, a significant global leadership position. Um, and we could, if we had the will, um, to onshore elements of it back to the United States and put in place an export control regime uh, that really protected key parts of the industry. And there have been some good signs. I mean, TSMC's decision to build potentially a $10 billion fab in Arizona is their way of squaring the circle, you know, because they came to us and they said, you know, we really want to sell chips to Huawei and we want to be part of the trusted supply chain for the Pentagon. And we said, you know what, I want to eat ice cream all day and not be fat, but you can't do both. Um, and so Mark Leo's decision was, okay, what if I build a trusted fab in the United States, make a major investment, put a technology control plan in place, put a firewall between the networks, make sure that we're not sharing people and tooling, um, and I can have it both ways. That is a perfect example of how to, to cooperate with private sector and with public sector interests to be able to ensure US national security, still allow TSMC to be very competitive, um, and, and yet at the same time, um, you know, not damage you know, another country's economy um, uh, for our own sake. And so I think that you know, there are ways to do this and the ITIF has had a lot of good um, ideas. I would just leave you with the following slogan. Industrial planning is an 18 letter phrase, not a four letter word. Um, you know, the Eisenhower interstate system, um, other big measures that, you know, the, the NASA and the moon programs, you know, the U.S. government does industrial planning all the time. Um, we've been led to believe that this, somehow this is the, the, the road to communism, uh, but it is absolutely not. Um, there are ways that the government and the private sector can partner that still maintain market competitiveness, but then provide the, the stability of US government funding and regulatory support in ways where one plus one equals three. Um, and we shouldn't be afraid of that. And I don't think the Biden people are afraid of it. So, well, so, since uh, James teed that up, I'm gonna just say we can trace American industrial planning back to 1791 and Alexander Hamilton. I mean, he is the father of American tech policy. What did he say? that um, if we want competitive advantage to Britain, we need to do our own manufacturing. It has to be advanced. And by the way, we can end slavery because we don't need people to do the work, we get machines. So this notion is part of our American fabric. Uh, what I would just like to mention are maybe two or three things right off the bat, which I think can happen. And I would certainly commend Stephen's reports because they're talking about the long-term strategy that has to happen, that should have happened, 20, 30 years ago that we cannot wait anymore, which is what do we do to make America competitive for semiconductors? Uh, but in the meantime, I think there's things the Biden administration can do today, and it's gonna build on James research, um, which, uh, which I think is excellent. So one of the encouraging things that um, if you listen to Anthony Blinken, who is the nominee for Secretary of State in his confirmation hearing, he described that he agreed that President Trump was correct to make a tougher stance on China. Now, maybe he doesn't agree with the way that he did it, but it was correct. It was right to, to, to start to restrict certain companies. And during the Trump administration, over 300 firms in China have been restricted, almost 100, particularly because of their links with the US military. In the semiconductor space, we have things like Jinwa Semiconductor, uh, SMIC, the Semiconductor um, Manufacturing International Corporation. Now, there's over 100 firms. 100 factories in China, maybe more, making these semiconductors. There are others that are military linked. We need to restrict today. They include things like Yangtze memory. You know, this is something that, that, that James has gone in deep uh, uh, detail documenting how this firm is pretending to the World Trade Organization that they have nothing to do with the Chinese military, but showing you why that's a lie and how they're involved. So American companies should not be doing business with them. And it is American Department of Commerce job to step in and to make that decision. So one of the things we should ask if it's gonna be Governor Raimondo from uh, Rhode Island or, or wherever, who will be the new Commerce, uh, sec uh, Commerce Secretary, who is gonna take the role for Bureau of Industry and Security? So the Trump administration has done a lot. They've put the ball in front of the goal. Biden's team can just kick it in. 
So there is a long tail of factories in China we need to address. We can look at Yangtze memory. We can look at CXMT. There's others. I'm sure that uh, James has much more detail on. But the evidence is there, and we need to act quickly. Um, Rosalind, I'm so glad that you went on ahead and added that um, because that is extremely important for us to like name and be very clear mm -hmm. about what we are looking at. And, um, you know, unless you kind of study these different companies and you study what they do in their relationship, which is why, you know, James, I'm very, very uh, grateful to have you on. I feel like a lot of people do love to talk about China, but they don't read, they're not familiar with party history, um, and they're not familiar with relationships, you know, within the country. So, um, yeah, and the, well, yeah the, well, the, the other short thing I would say, Alexia, is that, you know, in the old adage, amateur study strategy, professional study logistics, um, I think in the semiconductor space, um, amateurs are overly focused on fabrication facilities uh, and professionals study lithography and EDA tooling. Um, and that's really the major issue right now because we stopped um, uh, under the foreign direct product rule, we stopped Huawei uh, from and high silicon, which is Huawei's a silicon play from being able to get access uh, to these advanced chipsets. They naturally then tried to put pressure on TSMC. They tried to put pressure on Japanese and South Korean uh, fabrication facilities. This is something that hasn't been mentioned, but I think that any um, international cooperative effort is both the Europeans because of lithography manufacturers like ASML in Holland, but it's also uh, the Japanese and the Korean manufacturers, and we've had good dialogue with them. So it's it's more of a more of an OECD kind of coalition rather than simply a, a European coalition. Um, but the thing is, is that you know China then turned to SMIC that Rosalind mentioned and said, you know, we're going to be this is our national champion on on chipsets. Um, but where does SMIC get all of its tools? Where does it get all of its uh, lithography equipment? It gets it, you know, so we had to extend the foreign direct product rule in the entity list to SMIC. Then we turned to YMTC and that we fell a little short on this one. YMTC is China's national champion on DRAM and flash memory for solid state hard drives. Um, they also benefit from KLA and ASML and LAM and all these people selling them EDA tools and everything else. It's an, we didn't finish the job. We didn't finish a uh, movie because the Chinese will just designate national champion after national champion. Um, and so there is, by the way, a separate line of thinking that is not company based that some people in commerce are pushing and some of the Biden people are pushing, which is that it ought to be equipment based. So lithography and EDA tools of a certain sensitivity level that we ought to go back to more of a COCOM model where we're trying to protect specific types of equipment rather than playing whack-a-mole with different companies uh, because the Chinese can keep changing the company. So that's really an open debate right now. And I think that debate is sort of at the heart of what commerce is looking at. Um, we have an audience member, Adam, who essentially asked the question that you just answered. So Adam, I hope that that was a sufficient answer for you. Um, if you have any more questions, obviously, free, please feel free to like drop them in the chat. Um, so I wanted to ask you all, um, is there, you know, we've been pretty clear about our stance on this and like what, how we feel there, China's behaving and how we feel like it is a threat. Um, and I'm wondering if we could give any type of counter examples, any, if we could just step back and think from someone else's shoes for, for a second. Is there any reason to think that all of these policies um, that were enacted, Obama, Trump, probably continuing to Biden, are any of these an overreaction? Are we, is there any reason that we should think that we should not be um, taking the stance on the PRC's semiconductor strategy. Well, can I make one self-criticism? One um, self-criticism. Um, we'll um, yeah, is that um, I've tried to be fair. There, were, there have been cases in the past uh, where I thought we, we, we over-leveraged. Um, a good example was the concern about Lenovo laptops in the State Department. Um, Lenovo purchased the IBM ThinkPad unit there were a lot of people who are like, oh, well, a Chinese company bought it, therefore bad. But, but you have to dig into the details. And those think pads that Lenovo was selling were still being made in Mexico and North Carolina, not in China. And the quality control was such that I had a bunch of Lenovo engineers come up and talk about how they caught a subcontractor cheating them on like a quarter of a cent per chip or something like that. So again, just because it has a Chinese owner, um, does not mean that we have to, in fact, we reduce our credibility 
by broad brushing everything like that. Instead, we need to have, we need to do what my organization does, which is you know this is the tie to the military, this is the tie to the defense industrial base. You know, make real arguments. The other thing is, you know, my teenage daughters would want me to make a call out for TikTok. Um, I understand there's some privacy and data issues, um, but we really shouldn't be spending a whole lot of political capital on uh, 12 second video uh, apps uh, when there are so many more important national security uh, issues at stake. Uh, that we could be spending our time and precious political capital on. So, so let me uh, let me take. Um, I want to follow up with what James shared, and I absolutely agree that you need to do this deep technical analysis. You need to take the components apart and look at them. What I would say, however, with regard to Chinese technology, and this is what you know, what I do at China Tech Threat uh, is, I would say, if you look at the practices of the Chinese government, it's stated laws. Not that it's such a law respecting society, but its view is essentially asserting sovereignty over the internet. It has a, a set of espionage and security laws where any subject of the Chinese state can be enjoined to conduct spying on behalf of China. And essentially that it says any data on any Chinese device anywhere in the world can be, can be collected or reviewed or checked by China. So I would push back on the Lenovo argument for this reason. Um, when this acquisition was done in 2004 and then subsequently to sell IBM server division, there was quite a bit of um, uh, upset uh, in, in the government because this these IBM servers were installed in US military applications. This and today we are still paying the price for that to switch out the GPS server that the Air Force is using, which was earlier IBM, which was traded hands to Lenovo, was $375 million. Now that was not paid by Raytheon or IBM or Lenovo, that's paid by the taxpayers. And that's just one example of one of the costs we've had to bear because of this decision. So what could have happened is instead of saying, well, let's hurry up and let IBM sell off this division that they don't want anymore, we could have allowed a little bit more time to find a, a buyer we could secure that was not Chinese government owned, which Lenovo is, and we could have reduced that risk. I would say something else. The CEO of Lenovo is a member of the Chinese Communist Party. He lived in North Carolina for eight years. He said over and over that this acquisition would create jobs. Now today, Lenovo has 63,000 employees, less than 2,000 are in the US. They used to have 15,000 in Research Triangle Park alone. So if your goal was to secure jobs for the American economy, that was not a good policy decision. Now we can take any one brand, but look at GE today. All GE appliances are owned by hire. That's Chinese government owned. That G, they are, are basically freelancing off of the brand name of GE, which was an American company built up almost over a century. We also have it with Motorola, was the phone, the flip phone, you can remember one of the very first mobile phones in the 1970s, owned by, uh, also owned uh, with Chinese owners. It's essentially a Huawei phone that you can buy. So I, I think we need to take these things seriously. It may not be in any one technical analysis, but if you put it within the larger framework, of where China is going with this, it is really concerning. Well, actually, if I may, I just wanted to add one comment from the earlier question about you know yeah. what can you know everyday Americans do, and I completely agree with James. It's talk to your Congress members, talk to your policymakers about the need to invest in R and D, about the need for the United States to have serious technology and competitive strategies in areas like semiconductors or artificial intelligence. But one more would be also around education. You know, 81% of full-time graduate students in U.S. university electrical engineering and computer science programs are foreign born. We need to do much more to develop our own STEM pipeline in the United States. In fact, ITIF has called for uh, uh, kind of a National Innovation Education Act, uh, uh, kind of built on the NDA of the 1950s uh, to really, you know, turbocharge the, 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 the education system. Uh, and then to add to the point about, you know, why does it matter? You know, in the year 2005, China handed less than 1% of the global solar panel market. By the year 2011, they had 80%. They had used policies of massive overcapacity, massive industrial subsidization to create a glut in the marketplace that knocked out European firms like Solar World and American ones to, to the point they came to completely dominate that market as well. This is exactly what they're trying to do in semiconductors over the long term, right? Massive industrial subsidization of SOEs, state ownership of these firms state financed acquisition of foreign technology companies in the sector. Um, so as, as Rosalind and James said, if, if we're not aware to 
the long-term objective of their strategies, we're going to continue to experience severe industrial loss and the concomitant you know, employment and, and value add uh, losses that, that kind of you know, broadly undermines our technology economy. Yeah, and, and th this was my argument with the Biden people about sort of, you know, let's return to normal. And one of the elements of normal was um, let's, you know, go back to the WTO as a framework for enforcing these. But it's important, uh, someone mentioned earlier um, that the Chinese set up this national IC investment fund as a non-for-profit organization. Um, 40 of the top semiconductor policy officials resigned on the same day from the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology to join this nonprofit foundation, which was then funded by $150 billion of investments from state owned enterprises, who, by the way, were told to do it. Uh, they didn't do it because they thought it was a good market idea. But the whole point of this entire network was then they turned around and said, okay, let's spend $60 billion and buy Micron in, in Idaho and Manassas, which is one of our major DRAM and flash producers. That whole setup, that fund, was deliberately designed to evade the WTO uh, sanctions against illegal state subsidies. Because they could say, well, that's not a state organization, even though it was staffed by ministerial regulator um, uh, policy officials and funded entirely by state-owned enterprises, it technically was not uh, under the WTO illegal state subsidy definition. So we have to be more nimble and agile in sort of uh, adapting to these um, Chinese industrial planning strategies and not rely on sort of creaky old organizations like WTO uh, to be able to solve these problems for us. Guys, I'm not sure if you are, again, paying attention to all the panelists. Everyone is nodding and this is bringing me an outlandish amount of joy to hear these responses. Um, that is an excellent point, James. Um, another, another question that we have, and I think you guys can see the, the questions are kind of piling in from the audience. Um, I want to do my best to go in order. And um, I, I think I might want to kick this to Stephen, but if you don't want to answer it, anyone else can definitely uh, uh, bring it up. Um, a audience member is asking, um, with Taiwan at cyber and kinetic risk from China, um, Chip said IP and manufacturing, particularly for telecom things and then full cycle equipment. Um, can those things be insured to US? Um, Besides the example that I think James provided earlier um, about TSMC, um, you know, how can the U.S. help Taiwanese companies who are our largest? Was it Qualcomm's one of Qualcomm's largest um, chip suppliers? How can we help them, uh, given that they are at a closer threat than we are? United States immediately recognized Taiwan. It needs to bring Taiwan into the TPP when it joins the TPP itself. Um, and it uh, needs to uh, continue to, to find ways to engage. There's a program in Taiwan called Five Plus Two. It's kind of their national innovation strategy. Uh, the US could work uh, more fundamentally with exchange of scientific researchers, kind of with developing uh, kind of you know, the, the, some of the technology trajectories uh, for AI. Um, one of the challenges that Taiwan has uh, is, that, of course, that they're very strong on the hardware side. Um, well, obviously, with some semiconductors, obviously with uh, electronic equipment, uh, but they've been much weaker on the software side. They uh, have had less ability to integrate uh, artificial intelligence kind of in the next generation of their hardware. So I think there's a lot of collaboration that we could do with there to strengthen Taiwan's technology system. Um, and there's a wonderful report. If your colleague wants to email me, uh, I forget which think tank, but there's a 40 page report out about how the US can uh, assist the Taiwan with the development of their innovation ecosystem. That would be worth that for this meeting. Okay, yeah, no, I'll go ahead and email you. Um, let me make a note of it. Um, Dan, I'd love, to, I'd love for you to answer this question because I think that, um, you know, we're talking a lot about this is what the government, US government can do. Um, these are all the things that they need to take. We need to like staff up our, we need to staff up. You know, we need to like put more into education. Um, uh, uh, Stephen, I want to highlight strongly and say, um, you know, I used to work for a consulting firm and that is actually all we used to talk about in terms of like what an average American can do well, we need to make sure that our kids are smart. We need to make sure that our kids can do math. I don't even understand what the US government is asking for advancing if our kids can't do math. Um, but Dan, you know, we're talking about all these things that the US government can do. Um, and I think that, you know, one might be a little bit concerned and, and ask, well, is this a little bit, is, is this too much overreach? Is this a good use of uh, American dollars uh, since we have um, such an inflated uh, debt and we're, and we're trying to maybe like 
whole pull back government spending? Is this the thing that we should be spending our money on? Um, and, and I think that that is the question. One of the, one of the audience members asked, well, why can't the federal government um, supply, uh, fund a national supply chain for semiconductors similar to NASA? Um, and what if government funds, for example, were able to kind of do all of these, make a manufacturing plant in a semiconductor plant? So I'm wondering if you can kind of speak to why can't the US government do some of these things or can they? And is this a good use of money uh, in, the, in the long term? I'd argue that federal uh, research and development investments have been um, a huge boon in this area. Going back to World War II, um, the federal government played a key role in the development of the semiconductor industry. And if we look at this um, now 70 year history um, there have been key turning points, including in the 1980s, when uh, during the Reagan administration, um, national semiconductor policy ratcheted up um, to try and address competition from uh, Japanese um, uh, government efforts to try and um, challenge the US uh, semiconductor sector. Um, and uh, I think there's been you know, good research showing that those investments and the efforts that were done to try and develop and enhance uh, public-private partnerships around that period paid off years later. And to Stephen's point earlier, the you know, federal government uh, funding has been, been lacking in recent decades. Um, so I think it's a, absolutely where the kind of area where federal R&D dollars would be put to, to good use. And I think it's encouraging to see that there's broad recognition uh, you know, from you know, Senator uh, Schumer to Senator Cornyn um, in the Senate uh, around this idea, um, suggesting that there's you know, a pretty broad recognition Awesome, um, thank you. So um, there's another question. Um, can you talk more about uh, the current standoff of lithography company, uh, the lithography company ASML equipment um, export to China? How important do you think the Biden administration will take it um, to ensure and prevent um, selling key semiconductor tools to China? Um, I feel like I would like to kick this off to James, but if anyone else wants to hop in, please feel free. Well, well, the, the people I've spoken with um, uh, in the incoming team who understand technology issues, they know ASML is a critically important company to the ecosystem. Um, and they do not want to punish ASML in a way uh, because we know we're absolutely reliant on them. I mean, my, my best friend is the senior industrial control systems engineer at Micron's $5 billion fab in Manassas. And, you know, there's just acres of ASML equipment there particularly at the very, very smallest nanometer size on the, on the chipsets. Um, that being said, um, in, in some sense, LAM and KLA and, and ASML are really looking for guidance. You can imagine the dilemma that, that these companies have uh, where they, um, you know, in some cases have tens of millions of dollars of contracted products sitting on the shipping floor waiting for guidance from commerce um, about whether they're going to get approval for the licensing to be able to move it because it was all bespoke. It was all custom. It's not like they can just send those, you know, bananas somewhere else. Um, and they're looking, they're potentially going to be losing a large amount of money. So the best thing that, that commerce can do is to not sort of be half pregnant with the, the sort of decisions that they made about semiconductor tooling um, and uh, EDA and, and to finish the job one way or the other, because these companies um, that, that talk to me, uh, they're very, very concerned about this um, sort of stagnant inventory and large accounts receivable, aged receivables that they have uh, on these issues. Um, that being said, one of the things that we did, the reason the Mark Leo TSMC decision was good, the vulnerability of Taiwan is that they're within missile range. OK, there are lots of countries that maintain the Japanese have lots of manufacturing in the United States. My Honda, right, you know, is, a, is, is an American car, right, built in Springfield, Ohio. So um, the, what we said to the Taiwans was you can move your manufacturing here. You're out of the missile ring. Um, and that would allow us to include you in the in the in the trusted support. And so there is a bit of a push in that area to sort of try and square the circle with Taiwan manufacturing. And particularly given some of the really egregious cases of industrial espionage uh, that we saw, particularly with Fujian Jinhua um, and what they did with UMC uh, to steal Micron technology, uh, which was really just sort of wholesale locust taking every piece of carbon off the ground kind of stealing. Um, and we really want, and that was because of the proximity 
uh, to China that, that that was really facilitated. Um, you know, he also finds that tech alone is responsible for billions of dollars of intellectual property from, from PSD. Um, so uh, we talk a lot about the, uh, as we should, the, the US uh, Commission on Intellectual Property, which estimated $600 billion of uh, economic uh, IP theft from China to the US, but uh, it's also our allies uh, and friends like Taiwan, which has been hit very hard as well. Um, Stephen, I'm really glad that you went in that way, and I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that you kind of just took it a step further, because the next question that I wanted to ask, and it really aligns with some of the audience questions that we're getting, um, I, I, this panel is going really great, guys. There's like a lot of alignment on questions. It's great. Um, that means that this is a very important topic. People are concerned. Um, so, Rosalyn, I want to kind of start with you, and then, um, Stephen, I also know that you have some work on this, so if you want to hop in, please feel free. So there is, um, if you're kind of paying attention to the space, if you're listening to all the hardball talk from folks out of Congress, um, there seems to be like this appetite to want to punish China for its um, industrial espion espionage in the microchip space. Um, but we really can't tackle this really big problem. We can't punish them for a ton of things because our own economic security is wrapped up in our relationship. We have billions of dollars of trade with uh, China and that, and that clouds a lot of people's opinions, especially some of our elected officials who have really strong ties um, within the government and, and, and you know, with Chinese companies specifically. Um, so what should we do about this? This is crazy. We are Everyone's mad. This is awful. We need to do something. We need to push back. We need to work with our allies. Okay, well, how are we going to make sure that we're not also drowning ourselves in the process, given how much we have tied up with them? Well, I'm going to give you the great bit of good news of the panel, <clears throat> which is from an economic perspective, there is more business opportunity in working with like-minded democratic countries than there is in working with China. And the numbers already show that today. Just look at North America, Canada and Mexico. Our trade with Canada today alone, our trade with Mexico today alone, individually, it equals what we trade with China. So this notion that somehow China is essential to us and we have to do business with China and there's no other choice is wrong. Now, we can extend our trade, do more trade with Latin America, with Africa, with Japan, um, even in the European Union. I've lived in the EU over 10 years now. There is more opportunity for trade in the EU alone that more than compensates for the trade with China today. And that simply has to do with allowing the trade. We can also look at bad regulation the EU has adopted for years, uh, unwittingly or whatever. But we have more trade to do between the United States and Europe. And so this notion that it all has to be hung on China is absolutely wrong. And I see that myself having lived abroad so many years, so many countries rely on the US for security. They want the United States to take to stand up to China. They want this leadership. And if we can provide a path for them to do business among democratic and like-minded countries, they welcome that. It's, we, we're not alone in the ones who are concerned about a Chinese military that's gaining on the USA. That is not a unique concern to Americans. This is, you look at Pew's studies of uh, across um, democratic countries, everyone is concerned about this. Where this may falter is in translating into actual policy. It's certainly true that when uh, in 2018, when the um, legislation called FIRMA and ECRA to control, um, to tighten up rules around foreign domestic investment and outbound investment, certainly financial, US financial and this industry tried to weaken those because they wanna do business in China. But we have enough entities and enough friends and tra trading partners around the world that we don't have to hitch our wagon to China. Um, we have a really vibrant discussion happening in the chat and so many questions that we didn't get to. I really thought, I, tr I, I, I tried to get to everyone's questions, guys. Um, and I see you guys are still filing in and I am extremely excited to see it. Um, so like I said, we need to wrap up pretty soon because we need to go ahead and end this at three. Um, I definitely want to be respectful of all of our panelists' time, and they've been so generous with their knowledge and everything. Um, so I put the links for all of the panelists, their websites or their bios in the chat. You can very easily find them on social media. Um, you can obviously very find, easily find the LinkedIn network on social media. So please feel free to keep this conversation going. Um, I want to go ahead and dedicate the last couple of seconds to any last minute remarks that our panelists want to say. Roslyn, you ended it out very strong with um, us considering another uh, other economic opportunities. But if 
anyone wants to say some parting words, I would love to hear from you all. And uh, to the audience members, thank you. I really want us to continue this conversation online. I would only add that you know both the Obama and the Trump administrations uh, commissioned their PCAS, the President's Council on, on Advanced Technology, to uh, commission reports on the importance of semiconductor uh, industry in the United States and how to develop a long-term strategy for competitiveness in this industry. I would hope the Biden administration uh, does a serious in-depth analysis uh, as previous administrations have done and, and lays out a strategy for uh, enhancing U.S. competitiveness in this sector. Yeah, uh, Alexia, I just want to thank you for your very pro job of moderating this panel um, and, and for having us on today. Thank you. All right, guys, audience, thanks again. And panelists, thanks again. I will bother you all a little bit after this and everyone have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah.